There is one area, though, in which women actually benefit from getting the vote, and I'm thinking of the Cable Act. Talk to us a little bit about how women's nationality or her access to keeping her own nationality actually changes after women get the vote. Sometime in the mid-19th century, we don't know exactly when because it becomes customary practice, when an American-born man, a male citizen, married a foreign woman, under the image of coverture, the foreign woman instantly became an American citizen. He's the head of the household, she's part of his household, she's a citizen. But in the same kind of reasoning, when an American-born citizen woman married a foreign man, she lost her citizenship. If the other country didn't instantly move to make her a citizen or subject of that country, she was floating in an international legal void. She was stateless with no national protection. So she could be living in the United States. She could even be living in her hometown. Right. And having married a foreign-born male, she was suddenly made stateless in was, place, as it were. She was suddenly made stateless. There's a, a, a petition from a woman, Mary Das, who was a descendant of the pilgrims and who married a man from India. And she writes a piece that's published in The Nation magazine, and she says, I am a woman without a country. During World War I, hundreds of American-born women who had married German citizens had to register as enemy aliens. Uh, and that practice, which applied to um, Ulysses Grant's daughter, had to petition Congress to replace her citizenship after she was widowed, after she married a Brit. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatt, who came back to New York after she was widowed, uh, she married an Englishman, uh, to lead the League of Self-Supporting Women and Fight for Suffrage. She had lost her citizenship mm. in that way. And in 1907, when Consuelo Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt married right. the Duke of Marlborough, Congress went ballistic. Were there no American men good enough for her? Mm -mm. And they passed the Expatriation Act, which provided that such a woman absolutely, by law, lost her citizenship at marriage. Uh, and when Ethel Mackenzie in San Francisco, who had married the British consul in San Francisco, and who herself had worked very hard for suffrage in California. California gets, women get suffrage in California in 1913. She goes to present herself to vote. They tell her, you're no longer a citizen. She's very sophisticated. She brings a lawsuit. The suit goes to the US Supreme Court. In Mackenzie v. Hare, 1915, I've always complained. They did not teach me about this in mm -hmm. college. Um, uh, in 1915, the Supreme Court says marriage to a foreign man is voluntary expatriation. Sure. No man ever lost his citizenship by marriage under American law, ever. Mm. Hundreds, maybe thousands of American women did. So when women are fighting for the suffrage, one of the items on their agenda is the integrity of the nationality of married women. And when they get the suffrage, it's one of the first things they demand. And in the first years after suffrage, when men in Congress think, oh, those women aren't going to vote as a block. We better do something fast. They pass the Cable Act, which which is 1922 and protects the integrity of women who marry foreign men if those foreign men are themselves eligible for naturalization. And in 1922, men from Asia, from China, from, well, everyone, from China, from Japan, Japan. from Southeast Asia, from India, are not eligible for naturalization. So those were, it doesn't fit. It doesn't right. fix that at all. And peace, and in fact, that is tested in American courts in the course of the 20s and 30s, and they lose. And so only bit by bit 
in pretty much the era of World War II and after, first when the Chinese are our allies in World War II and this doesn't seem right and so forth, does that piece of that law get fixed?